Hello, everybody. I have a really special person in today. Wait, all of the speakers are really special. <laughs> I am really honored today to be speaking with Dev Soul, who is an herbalist who I have known about since uh, I was in college many, 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 many years ago, decades ago. And uh, actually, I have, I still have my copy of her first book, A Women's um, Book of Herbs, which it's probably one of the only books I kept from college, my college days in the 90s. <laughs> Literally, I, you know, it's moved with me from Florida to Virginia to New Hampshire to um, California, no, back to DC, California. And now it's been in California with me for 15 years or whatever. It's <laughs> so, yeah, helped me through uh, just becoming a woman, fertility having babies, you know, all of it. And i um, just so honored to have you here. Uh, I'm very happy and honored to be here with you and everyone. So thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll just say a little bit about the context of why I'm so happy to have you be a part of this symposium, which is that uh, your work not only is about herbs and gardening and all of these things, but is really, um, cognizant and aware of our connection to the earth and the spiritual dimensions of our relationship to this planet mm -hmm. and how crucial it is as we heal our world and heal, heal ourselves. And then also you draw this connection in your work between um, our connection to the planet and the reemergence of the feminine. And you're very dedicated to fostering diversity and, you know, nurturing people of all, all kinds on this planet. And so your values also are really uh, uh, in line with the symposium and right. So, um, yeah. yeah. So today, before we start, I just want to read your bio for people who aren't familiar with you or refresh those of us who are. Uh, Deb Soul began gardening and studying the medicinal uses of herbs over 45 years ago while growing up in rural Maine. In 1985, she founded Avena Botanicals Herbal Apothecary and Healing Gardens in Rockport, Maine, where she tends a three-acre biodynamic herb garden, providing numerous herbs for Avena Botanicals, herbal tinctures, teas, salves, and creams. The overall Farm serves as a sanctuary for pollinators, plants, and people, and houses a small nonprofit educational center titled The Herbal Classroom. And I just want to show your second book, which you just put out pretty recently, right? Yeah, a year ago. A year ago. Yeah. So beautiful. This was it was a really fun book to work on. I had I got to work with a fabulous photographer, Molly Haley, and um it was so beautiful to get to see the garden through her eyes. Um and she was able to photograph three different hummingbirds um, in our time together, which they're very, very special to me. And I, I grow a lot of flowers for hummingbirds. So mm. yeah, the book is just full of beautiful imagery, but my, you know, my, uh, the book was really, again, my years and years and years of gardening and just wanting to inspire and support people who want to grow medicinal herbs and learn how to gather them and to dry them with lots of love and respect. So yeah, it was a really fun project. <laughs> cool. so, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to share my screen and um, going to see lots of beautiful images of my garden and plants. Yay. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there we go. Yes. So this is just one corner of my garden. Um, I'm on an old 32 acre farm. I'm near the coast of Maine. And I wanted to begin by just uh, really recognizing and honoring that I am a guest in Penobscot territory. I live um, in what is now known as Maine. So we're the most Northeastern state in the United States bordering the Maritimes in Canada. And um, this is the sun rising over Penobscot Bay. 
there are five different tribes uh, recognized in what is called the Wabanaki Confederacy. So I am a guest in Wabanaki in uh, Penobscot territory. Um, there are also, I want to also honor the Passamaquoddy and the Mi'kmaq and the Maliseet and the Abenaki. Mm -hmm. So I feel a great honor to be a caregiver of this land that I've been on for 27 years. And um, I, I just give thanks for the people, indigenous people who have been here for over 15,000 years as really good stewards of land. And I also wanted to begin by just honoring a few people who have been my most important teachers. So Juliet de Berkeley Levy, this is a picture of her um, in her 90s, visiting me and my farm in Rockport. And this is a beautiful documentary about her life. Juliet, um, her parents were Turkish and Egyptian, and she was raised in England. And she spent mu much of her life living amongst and learning with the Arab Bedouins and the gypsies of the Middle East. So this is a beautiful documentary for people who are interested in um, lineage of herbalism and somebody, Juliet, who really, I would say, helped to re-inspire a lot of herbalism in, in um, North America. I mean, I think many of us recognize that there was just such a huge genocide in North America that a lot of um, so many healers were killed and lost, not unlike what happened in the Inquisition in Europe. So um, really want to honor all healers around our planet who have connected or reconnected with their lineages and the plants that are native to them. And um, Juliet is one of those people. So I like to honor her. And I also want to honor um, Rocio Alacon. This is a um, her website for people who might be interested. She is uh, born and raised in Ecuador, coming from a long lineage of traditional female shamans and healers. Um, Rocio, this is a photograph I took of Rocio and I had the honor to spend two weeks with her in the Spanish side of the Basque country. And she was working on her PhD, collecting lots and lots of specimens of native medicinal plants. And this was a shepherd that actually that we were, she was talking with, obviously Spanish is one of her languages. She speaks Quechua and a few others. Um, so she was just collecting tremendous amount of information before it got lost. Um, Rocio also is very, very connected to hummingbirds as I am. So um, for people who are, who are interested in her work in Ecuador, I really encourage people to visit her website and just amazing work she's doing around just the diversity of our of the rainforest and protecting the rainforest, protecting pollinators, protecting this ancient lineage of female healers that she is part of. So I want to again really a great bow to our traditional healers around the world. And I also just wanted to put a shout out to the late. Uh, Buddhist monk from Vietnam, Thich Nhat Hanh, who has also been a very important person in my life um, for over 30 years, really helping me integrate mindfulness into how I garden um, and how I give different ways that I give offerings to the plants and to the spirit of the plants. So I want to say deep, a deep bow to Thich Nhat Hanh. And the other person that I just wanted to mention is Vandana Shiva. Um, this is a photograph from her organic farm in Northern India. Um, there is an extraordinary documentary film, um, recent one that came out about Vandana Shiva. I really appreciate her work um, on so many levels, but particularly she is one of the first people to be so outspoken about the real dangers of genetically modified organisms and seeds. So if people are unfamiliar with Vandana Shiva's work, she's written many books and um, certainly really a, a woman who, again, is just tireless in her deep commitment to the feminine and honoring earth and honoring traditional people's ways of gathering seed, saving seed, sharing seed, and um, really building healthy communities. So... Thank you, Vandana Shiva. So I wanted to also just 
um, remind us that all living beings, not just humans, need water. And so for myself, as an herbalist um, and one who is very always um, watching for all the beings like frogs and different birds and pollinators and worms and all kinds of life that requires water. I just really wanted to honor water and wa and honor all those sacred water keepers around the planet and honor the seed keepers around the planet. So this is the queen of my garden. <laughs> so where I live, um, we have one species of hummingbird. We have the ruby-throated hummingbird. And this is a photograph of the female who was taken in my garden several years ago, landing on a magnolia blossom actually in my garden. We have a bird photographer. And I just wanted to really honor the pollinators because without our pollinators, we will not have seeds. We will not have plants. We won't have medicine plants. We won't have food. So again, in my work as a gardener, as a herbalist, as a healer, I am always planting and interplanting flowers, especially for the hummingbirds, but for many different species, native species of bees. And I just, I wanted, what I wanted to say about the hummingbirds is, um, they are, they are only native to the Americas. Um, there are, the ruby throat does go up into the Maritimes into the, the Eastern seaboard all the way up into Canada. Um, in North America, we have somewhere around 18 species that come and go based on the weather. But in Ecuador, where I have studied and spent time with Rocio studying hummingbirds, there are about 340 different known species of hummingbirds in Ecuador. So Colombia and Ecuador is the, is the heart of, of the most diversity of hummingbirds, but throughout the Americas. So I have this um, deep prayer that the way that the hummingbirds migrate through the Americas, that they are holding a deep, deep energy of healing because we all also know that there has just been a tremendous amount of suffering um, for over 500 years because of settlers coming and really deep, deep suffering for so many peoples in the Americas. And I feel like the hummingbird is a bringer of healing and moves easily between the worlds. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to honor the hummingbirds and all their, their incredible medicine they bring to us. Yeah, and a lot of hummingbird uh, visitors today, this morning. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. Well, this for people who um, who don't necessarily have a garden, um, I, I put my window box of, this is actually a variegated nasturtium, but hummingbirds love nasturtium flowers. And this is actually, I just planted them out actually this week. Um, they'll start to flower probably in a couple of weeks. This is from last year. But I put them right underneath the windows where the apothecary is making medicine so that the hummingbirds can come right up to the window. So just for people to say nasturtium flowers and leaves are edible for us as humans. So I'm constantly nipping off any of the spent blossoms so that the, they'll just keep flowering and flowering. And they like to grow in like partial partial shade, partial sun. So these window boxes get sun in the morning and then um, they get shade the rest of the day. So that was just a, an inspiration for people who might want to grow something in window boxes or a hanging plant. Nasturtiums are a wonderful one, um, both for being edible and also for, for bees and hummingbirds. And this is um, the center of our sanctuary garden. We have um, a few hundred different tree shrubs, medicinal um, plants, annuals and perennials, and then a number of native wildflowers that I let them reseed throughout the garden. Um, so for, the, for anyone who's interested or for any of you who have gardens, I always say the center of a garden is a very important kind of place to create. Um, I think gardens have such potential for being healing spaces spaces for being sanctuary. And that's certainly what my garden was created with that, that awareness. Um, so I'm hoping that more and more people everywhere will be creating small and large herb gardens and creating little centers 
where, um, yeah, there is a focal point for bringing people and energy together. So, and I, before I start talking specifically about plants, I always have to talk about living soil. And what I mean by living soil is that there are so many ways that soil, living soil has been disturbed and really polluted on our planet. And um, for me, soil is the skin of our mother earth. And so for me, it's like, I, there's a beautiful poem that I always think of, um, which is like, I just kneel to the earth. And I do this a lot in my, some of my prayerful practices. Um, sometimes I'll just like kiss the earth. I just feel like it's like I'm kissing mother earth. And so for me as a gardener, this is one of the ways that I feel very, very deeply dedicated to really supporting the health of, of our earth and really helping people to learn basic skill sets. Um, you know, we really need to be done with synthetic fertilizers and pesticides and fungicides and all the ways that you know, constant tillage is just destroying soil structure. And we really are about building diversity of plants and diversity of cover crops. And as I said, really keeping those living roots in the soil and supporting the mycorrhizal fungi, which connect us all in the underground brilliance and never leaving our soil bare. I live in a place, I live in zone five. So we do get winter where the ground freezes Sometimes we have snow cover, sometimes we don't, but I never leave soil bare. And particularly people living in places where that's hotter, wind erosion, really wanna make sure that we don't leave soil bare. Some kind of mulch cover cropping is just so important. So I just wanted to, though this is, um, this. I mean, I could spend hours just speaking on this one subject. I just wanted to really honor living soil and really, plant that seed for people who maybe haven't thought about soil in the, the spiritual sense that I speak of soil and the microbiological activity in living soil that nourishes all of life. So compost for gardeners and farmers is where it's at. And this is just a very simple home system for people. I just take old wooden pallets and we layer in food scraps and straw and green plant materials and we're just constantly layering. And then I put a big cover on top of just straw, thick, thick straw, and it composts. What I do is I have I have three bins. So we one is going and then we flip it so that it will continue to compost. And then we start building a second one. So for me, here's these beautiful, beautiful red worms. This is about compost is where it's at for helping to build living soil. And there we are, my friend Laura, who I garden with, we built a big, long, what we call a windrow. And my neighbor comes, he's behind there with his tractor and he bucket loads. We, um, we have two different systems, like home system that I showed you. And then the big system of lots of comfrey and nettles and organic cow manure and straw. And, um, and he helps, he builds that with his bucket loader of his, of his tractor. So again, just planting a few seeds for folks who may be working in backyard gardens. Some folks may be having the opportunity to be farming. Um, this, this is one way that we just call a windrow, but I always say the compost should be front and center to any garden and farm because it is the nutrients that continue to nourish our soil, our living soil. And I also just wanted to put a shout out to hedgerows. I am a big fan of hedgerows and um, what, what you're seeing in the back are the white flowering hawthorn trees. And when I first put in our sanctuary garden, I planted 48 hawthorn trees. They line, they make a beautiful, beautiful circle, which has basically created a sanctuary garden because now they're like 25 feet tall. And we gather hawthorn flowers in late June to make tincture and dry them for tea. It's beautiful, beautiful heart medicine. And then in October, we gather the red berries also beautiful, beautiful, supportive medicine for any kind of um, stress in the heart, helping to lower mildly elevated blood pressure, 
helping to encourage really healthy overall circulation throughout the body. Also, I like to say that Hawthorne, for people who are having trouble sleeping, Hawthorne is very, very quieting to the spiritual heart and allows one, when the, when the spirit in the heart is settled, we can sleep better. So I'm giving a little bit of teaching about Hawthorne, but I also really wanted to say trees are an excellent perennial cover crop to be able to build hedgerows for birds and pollinators and children love to hang out under trees and yeah they're beautiful to consider and garden benches just to say i have become a fan of putting garden benches everywhere to remind me as a gardener to sit down and to also take in the beauty of of the garden or the different seasons the one on the right is the early 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 spring for us um yeah so we want to be really caring for ourselves. So I also just offered a few of some of the ways that I take care of myself as a gardener. Um, and I actually, these are practices that I um, do on a daily basis throughout the growing season. And actually year round, I do go out at dawn to give thanks for the day. And so I hope wherever people live that you are be able to have this really very vibrant and mindful relationship with the daily rhythm of the sun and the lunar rhythms and the seasonal rhythms. For us here, we have five very distinct seasons. I know different people live in different places in the world, so the seasonal changes are different, but for us, we are just entering in, into um, early summer in Maine. It's, it's very, very beautiful. Um, I am definitely somebody who loves to create altars in my garden. And we, in the summertime, we also create these beautiful vessels where we can leave offerings in the garden. So I just want to encourage people to, in whatever ways you are inspired to spend time really feeling the pulse, the heartbeat of Mother Earth, going barefoot when you can, feeling her energy really pulsing in your feet taking the time to slow down particularly at dawn and dusk and when the moon when the moon is new when the moon is full these are such beautiful times for us to really honor honor our life here on this beautiful beautiful planet and our connection to the cosmos that is so all so amazing gonna make me cry yeah, wow oh yes and so as we move into speaking specifically about plants. These are beautiful calendula flowers. I also was very fortunate to receive, I started to be trained as an herbalist when I was a teenager. So my whole life has been very deeply rooted in recognizing that plants are our teachers and that each of them has this incredible presence of being a spirit and they each have gifts. So for me, that's where it's really important that before we do any gathering of plants on our farm, we're always sitting in a, just in a, in a silent way, each of us individually, um, connecting with the spirit of the plants, offering our gratitude and offering a gift. And that's something that anybody um, in any tradition can find um, the teachings of, of your own ancestors and, and perhaps learn how they made offerings. And if they didn't, to ask in your dreams, to ask in your meditations, what feels really authentic for you and making gifts to the plants. So I, obviously I am just deeply, I just deeply, deeply love plants. And I wanted to, to hear, just offer a little bit of some of the different ways that we use plants. So obviously we are gathering plants and drying them, which I will talk about for beautiful herbal teas and especially in the winter time, but also um, we're making things like herbal tinctures and glycerates and elixirs and syrups, putting herbs in honey and apple cider vinegar, making topical oils and salves and poultices, steaming with herbs, making foot baths with herbs. Also in various cultures around our world, people have cleansed and with different ways for herbs to clear away negativity and also working with flower essences, which I'll talk about. So there's so many ways that the plants gift us with their medicine. 
One is a sun tea. This is this is actually beautiful lemon balm and red clover growing in my garden. We just gather them fresh and cover them with water and just put it outside um, in the daytime. And just we, I just every day make a fresh sun tea and I just sip on it through the day. And then you can also make a hot tea. So when I say leaf and flower infusion, these are rose petals and red clover blossoms that were dried and I just put them in a pot, covered it with water and warmed it up. I don't boil it. I just warm it with a lid and then I have a hot cup of tea. And then a decoction is a root tea. So we infuse our leaf and flowers. We simmer any of our roots and barks for 30, 40, 50 minutes. And then I also am a big fan of people making soup stocks for themselves. You can can them, you can freeze them, you could um, you know, have them fresh. This has actually got a lot of nettles and onions and thyme. This is something that I do every fall and I can about 30 quarts of soup stock. So just again, I'm introducing some things people may be very familiar with. Um, soup stock, nettle soup stock is a favorite one of mine because I think soups can be so medicinal for us to, um, yeah, in the food that we're eating. So, and this is what a tincture looks like, actually. These are the hawthorn berries. I showed you the hawthorn trees, but they were flowering. Um, this is in the fall, the red berries, we ground them up in a, each, each particular tincture that I make has a different recipe based on the constituents of the herbs. So hawthorn berry is made with, we make it with spring water, and um, about 43% of an organic alcohol. And we grind it. And then you're seeing on the left, these are the shelves where all the tinctures that we make, they're infusing for six to eight weeks. And then we press them off and fill them in bottles, depending on what someone is needing. And vinegars. So these are actually beautiful dandelion leaves and roots that we had brought in and um, I'm about to make some more vinegar with them. And what's they're sitting on is actually some vinegar I had made earlier with other wild greens. So anything that you might be growing that's nutrient rich, like parsley and chickweed, and there's some purple basil in there. Making our own vinegars is such a wonderful way to also add in nutrient dense herbs um, as part of our food. So they're really wonderful to make. And then I just wanted to speak to flower essences. Some people are familiar with flower essences. Some people may not be. But as I mentioned earlier, that each flower, each plant is so deeply intelligent. They each have their own personality and their spirit. I think any of us who have time to take a little bit of time to sit with either trees or different flowers to really breathe in their the flowers, beautiful, beautiful fragrances. We um, probably each of us has certain flowers that we have a more resonance with than others. So I, I did just sort of kind of for anybody who wanted to be able to really study flowers since I, I described a little bit about how we make them, but it's not the chemistry of the flowers. It's the energy. It's that vibration of the flowers that is infusing in water, either from the, a sunny day or a full moon. And then I'm just um, pouring off that water. And I I personally, um, it, I preserve them in a little bit of biodynamic brandy. Um, and those mother essences will last for many, many years. So this is what one looks like when we're, we're ca carefully, we don't touch the flowers when we're putting them into a bowl. And then they'll be infusing for a few hours before we pour them off and give some back to the plant in gratitude. And then they get, put into little bottles. So for us, um, at, in my apothecary, we've made a couple different flower essence kits. Um, I was really inspired to make one um, using flowers from my garden that the, that the hummingbirds and the bees um, are always all over. So this is what, what I call it, the pollinator collection. Um, and what- the, the essence of the bees too, in a sense, like the- Yes. Yeah, oh, wow. So essence of bees and hummingbirds, like mm -hmm. what I sit and when the hummingbirds had come and visited the nasturtium and the zinnia, then I actually went after, and those are the flowers that I gathered into the bowl and oh. so infused. So yeah. And just to say that these, 
um, Flower Essences is a collaboration with a friend of mine, Lisa Esterbrook, who um, she's the artist and her beautiful work is called Soul Flower, um, the Soul Flower Oracle Deck. She's written a beautiful, beautiful Oracle Deck mm. that um, people can find her online. So this is a really special collaboration that we take together. I just put one drop from one of these essence bottles in my water bottle every day. Um, and so usually I put fresh herbs in my, in my quart water bottle. And then depending on um, what energy of the flower that I'm needing, like right now I'm working a lot with nasturtium and sunflower. Um, I just put one drop in my quart water bottle and I sip on that through the day. And oftentimes I'll have a little water bottle by my bed at night. And the same thing, I'll put a drop in my um, water that I'm going to sip on when I wake, wake up in the night to really help to support and heal um, really the deep inner journey that each of us is on. So flower essences are really, really helpful for helping to bring a much more of a balance and harmony and whatever whatever is stirring in us that we are working with. There's so many flower essences and people have made them all over the world to help us in our inner journey. Yeah. Can I ask one question about that? Yes. Is there a, a, a reason you would um, have them sit under the sun versus the full moon? Ah, uh, great question. Really depends on um, if you have, like there are a few flowers, like I can say the white Nicotiana flower is very, very much a moon flower. And so if there are any flowers that, that really speak to you of the moon, those are the ones that I that I will infuse in the moonlight. But like all of these in this particular pollinator collection, they're all in the sun. And that's because each of them are really vibrant during a sunny day. And during the sun is when the pollinators are active. These are particular pollinators. I mean, obviously there are, there are bats and things that are active at night, but um, these particular flowers are really for the bees and the hummingbirds. So yeah, so just if somebody's really tuning into a flower and it really feels like there's a connection to the moon, that's when I would I would then make that in the full moon. Yeah, Beautiful. yeah. So I wanted to speak to a few of my favorite flowers and I, um, I wanna say that again, I recognize that people are living in different parts of the world, um, but I hope that this will just inspire you to be um, growing, gathering, studying the plants that, that you live around. And Blue Vervain is native to where I live. Um, it grows two to five feet tall and it's just a beautiful, beautiful blue flower that blooms kind of late July into August. And this is one that I let reseed in my garden. And um, it will often, if people are kind of hiking or walking along um, stream banks or even in kind of damp fields, sometimes blue vervain will be growing. It is the, the flowering tops that we are gathering. And so I wanted to just kind of give a little bit of contain, containment to how I work with medicine plants is that I'm, I work with them at, on a daily basis as teas that are very nourishing and nutritive. I'm always cooking with herbs in my food. I'm drinking sun teas, and those are just full of minerals and vitamins and very nourishing. Here, when I use the word tonic, what I mean by the word tonic is there are there's a whole grouping of, of plant medicines that when taken daily over consistently over like four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, tonic herbs begin to really build and rebuild and restore different organs and systems in the body. So blue vervain, when I use the word nervine, blue vervain is a tonic herb for the nervous system, particularly for folks holding so much tension in the neck and the shoulders. I'm being one of those people. Also for people who have endured a lot of long-term stress that it's interesting, we're beginning to understand that that kind of chronic stress can lead to anxiety, can lead to adrenal exhaustion, can also lead to mild depression. So blue vervain, as I've said here, is one that I often take with skullcap over several months. And I will talk about skullcap 
um, shortly, but to really, really strengthen the nervous system and to ease, ease anxiety. It can be used as a tea. I, I prefer it as a fresh made tincture. And it's one that I tend to use more like five or 10 drops. Um, I know for folks going through menopause, sometimes blue vervain they'll keep by their bed, the tincture. And if they wake up in the night with a lot of um, hot flashes, um, blue vervain sometimes can be helpful just to bring some ease in that situation. So blue vervain is, is definitely um, native to kind of the Northeast of North America up into Canada. It's a beautiful plant. And then bone set, I really wanted to honor bone set, which has been very, very sacred to a lot of indigenous people in um, the whole Northeast, all the way out into the Midwest to Michigan, Minnesota, that kind of all across um, this part of North America. So it's a white flower, has a very unusual leaf and we gather this plant. I have many growing in my garden and it reseeds in my garden. Um, and we gather it both, to, you can dry it for tea. We also make a fresh tincture. It's very, very, very bitter. This is a plant also that really likes to grow in damp areas. It's one that um, I, I really encourage people to consider growing because it's so really important for helping um, when the whole body aches because of a fever. So traditionally it was called break bone fever. Mm. So bone set as a fresh tincture is, I think is a more, is a more concentrated way to do it. But, but bone set tea also people can dry it and have it in the winter. As I said here, it was widely used during the 1918 flu. Um, I use bone set for folks when they have fevers with tick-borne different types of conditions. And also during the during COVID, this is one that I have used uh, for people who have had various types of fevers. Mm -hmm. um, the cover of this book is one of my favorite herb books. I wanted to include it. Um, and I gave you a quote here by the late Kiwi Denokwe, who basically requested that her teacher, I mean, that her student who she was teaching, Mary Genoes, who is the author of this book, um, Kiwi Denokwe basically said to her, you need to write down all that I'm teaching you. So Kiwe Denoiko was incredibly generous as an indigenous Anishinaabe herbalist and healer from what we think of today as Michigan and Minnesota, um, highly trained traditionally as an herbalist and also trained as an ethnobotanist. Um, so she also, I just wanted to quote her here because she also was highly recommending bone set with broken bones. Um, yeah, this is a beautiful book for people to consider. And Horsetail, I, I first wanted to put a, 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 a painting. This is from a favorite book of mine. So people could see the underground network of Horsetail. Mm, this grows all across the, all throughout the Northeast, all the way out West, grows in damp, damp places. I wanted to honor Horsetail as it was once a tree. So this is one of our most ancient plants that we have in North America. Very, very, very ancient. So there are both infertile stalks and fertile stalks that grow. But I really, I just, the underground rhizome system is just extraordinary. This is a plant that when it grows in community, I mean, it grows in community, it's quite something. So here's a photograph of what the above ground part of the plant looks like. And we harvest the horsetail. Um, this is about the time of year I harvest in either late May or into early June. And you, it can be dried as tea, can also be made into a tincture or even apple cider vinegar. Um, it's the silica in horsetail is what's so important for strengthening bones and cartilage muscles, people who might have nails that, that break really easily. And I've also combined it with my favorite herb, Solomon seal, um, for also any damaged cartilage and strengthening joints and arteries. So a fabulous herb just for people to know. And, and also just to say that there are many um, professional gardeners and horticulturists who really despise horsetail because when it comes into an area, it can really take over an area. So I'm, I, I wanted to also let horsetail be a voice in this conversation about who stays and who gets pulled out. 
And so for, I, I like to just really encourage kind of people who are tending kind of more formal type gardens. Um, if they're going to remove horsetail first would be to cut it and make good medicine um, and to always leave a patch of it somewhere in, in that garden, because it is a really important medicinal plant. And then I just, I have a real relationship with Greek mullen, but I wanted to differentiate between common mullen and Greek mullen. This is a photograph in my garden of the Greek mullen flowers. And this is um, the common yellow throat warbler. Mm -hmm. And I am so grateful. We, we have about 60 different species of birds that are here and on our farm that have been photographed by my friend who's a bird photographer. And um, I feel like sanctuary gardens are so essential in this time that we're living in. Even if someone's living in, a, in an urban area, you know, put up some trees or shrubs and things that will offer refuge to the birds. The birds are really needing sanctuary places. So this is a very common and very, very easy plant to grow. It's a biennial. So the first year, it's just, a, it's a beautiful rosette of leaves. And then the second year, it sends up these really extraordinary flowering, tall flowering spikes. So on the left and on the right, you are seeing Greek melon. And we gather when they start to bloom in July, we get, we put little we tie little berry baskets around our necks and we go out earlier in the morning and we're gathering the mullen flowers. And then in the center photograph is the common mullen. And you can see the difference There's just one stalk. So I, because I am so deeply committed to flowers for pollinators, I am really trying to encourage more and more people to grow Greek mullen. In the fall, the different birds, particularly goldfinches, will come and they'll just devour the seeds. So I leave those stalks to, you know, to dry up um, in the fall so that the birds can come in. Greek mullen also will reseed in incredible abundance. So you also probably will be weeding mullen, giving some away, perhaps adding some into the compost pile. It's a prolific, prolific, very generous plant. And as I said, we gather the, the, the plants of the first year plants that don't have a flower stalk and I dry them and I make tincture for helping soothe the lungs and expel mucus from the lungs. But the, both the leaf and the flower, they soothe, inflame lung tissue. So the flowers, I actually put them, I make an elixir from them with glycerin and a little bit of alcohol. You could also put them in honey. The flowers of flowers, you can't dry. They basically will dry up to pretty much nothing. And as you can see, they bloom for about three weeks. So they're everyday new flowers are coming covered with um, different types of bees. Mm -hmm. I think mullen is a very, very important tonic for the lungs. So for people who have the lungs is a place where they're more vulnerable um, to just inflammation. This is a really wonderful wonderful tea and an elixir and tincture to really support the health of one's lungs. And Is here's this. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Any, any difference medicinally between the common and the green? No, they're the same. They can both be used. So I, I probably 30 years ago, I got my first Greek mullen seed from a company in the West coast called strictly medicinals. And they are in, um, Williams, Oregon is where Strictly Medicinals is. And once I started some plants, I never had to start them again. So I, I really encourage people to consider growing the Greek melon because there's just so much abundance of flowers. Yeah. yeah. And then the skull cap, which I, I said I would speak to, this is also one of our native um, plants here where I live. And I also... Um, grow a lot of skullcap in my garden and we harvest it just like at this stage when you can see the blue flowers in this photograph. So interesting enough, skullcap is actually this particular North American skullcap. This is native to North America. Um, it's We gather the whole tops when they're flowering. And I love fresh skullcap tea. I don't like the dried skullcap tea as much, but some people might enjoy it. 
I the fresh skull cap tea is amazing. So I can drink fresh skull cap over several weeks. Um, even once you know the flowers have gone, I I still will gather some for fresh tea, and I make a lot of um, fresh tincture or fresh non-alcohol glycerin base also from the skull cap when they're flowering. They're just an incredible incredible medicine. So here you see us gathering the skull cap with um, a pair of clippers and then there's a basket. Um, this is how it is for on our apothecary. We're gathering big baskets of the medicine plants and bringing them in. And then the person who um, makes our medicine will then we'll take these and, and grind them into fresh tincture and fresh glycerin. So again, you're seeing the term tonic and nervine. Skullcap is an extraordinary tonic, safe for long-term use. As I said, I use it sometimes with blue vervain and I'll speak to milky oats next, which I also use with milky oats. So very, very over a period of time, two or three times a day, over several weeks, over several months, really helps to lessen anxiety, helps to ease insomnia, any kind of stress, restlessness for people who um, have a lot of fear, just a very soothing and comforting and calming herb and safe. And um, it's also one I use for people with Parkinson's, um, people and animals actually, who have different types of tremors and epilepsy. So, um, I combine skullcap with milky oat glycerin for folks who are working with different types of addictions. So the nervous system deeply needs to be supported over a long period of time for folks who are really shifting various aspects of their lives and their lifestyles to be, um, yeah, shifting something that has been, they've been addicted to in their life. So skullcap and oats, really, really important. And then here's the oats. So what I want to say about the oats, oats are found around the planet in more temperate um, to cooler climates. Um, there's different species. This is a species that I used, I grow in my garden. And this is the oats that we end up eating. So for people who um, love to eat oatmeal in the morning or who might grind oat as flour, or making whole steel cut oat cereal. Um, this is the plant. Just what happens is it turns golden brown, and then it's harvested for food. Herbalists harvest it when it's when it's just like this. Mm -hmm. Like, let me go on to one more. Whoops. Well, there's a big field of it. Mm -hmm. There we are, my partner's biodynamic farm, harvesting a few hundred pounds of oats. But this is what I wanted to say. It's the green milky seed stage. When the when those seeds are green and we press milk out of them, that's when we harvest. Wow. Um, that's what we're doing here. And there, we have a window of about maybe a week when they're ripe and ready for us to be able to harvest them. Yeah, and I just wanted to say, I also use oats as a cover crop. When I pull my garlic out, I sow oats and it gives a beautiful thick mat. Also, we have sowed our oats for our medicine um, and it's starting to look like this. And then it will send up its beautiful, beautiful stock like that. Mm -hmm. And as, as I said, as it turns green and milky, there we all are out there gathering. Mm -hmm. And then that's a basket of it. So it is one of the most restorative herbs, as I said, alongside skullcap for the nervous system, just very, very important for anybody who's enduring a lot of chronic stress um, and yeah. acute stress. Yeah, and it's just so gentle and- Yes, very, very gentle herb, yeah. And then I, I really wanted to bring in rose. Mm. The rose of Ragosa, there are many different species of rose. These are the three main species. So I actually wanted just to speak to this too. What I've given you um, as I've been talking about the herbs, I've given you the, the common name that we know where I am anyway. I've given you the botanical names. And I also just want to recognize that um, it's complicated. Traditional healers all over the world, um, many don't have any need to learn Latin names. It's really, you know, the botanical names really came out of kind of a, 
a really more white male centered botanical world. So it's, it has, it's definitely problematic and complicated. Um, also Latin, the language of Latin um, allows us to know something about that we're actually talking about the same plant. So there's a place here. And so that's what you're seeing here. Rosa Ragosa is the photograph in my garden. Rosa Damascena and Rosa Gallica are two other species that are commonly used um, for medicine. And what's interesting to me is the Rosa Ragosa originally came from China. And as plants do, they move with people. And Rosa Ragosa moved west um, into India, northern India, Persia, up into um, Europe, and somehow jumped the Atlantic Ocean. Where I live, Rosa Ragosas are naturalized all along the beaches and the islands. And I grow several dozen. I have a beautiful, huge hedgerow of roses of which I gather. There I am gathering the medicine. So the roses will start to bloom in the next couple of weeks and we'll be out every morning gathering roses mm. for their medicine. So rose is one of the most important medicines we have for the heart. So rose taken as the rose, whole rose or rose petals for tea. People can put roses fresh or dried in honey. I make a rose petal elixir that's about three quarters made with an organic sweet glycerin and then a little bit of alcohol to preserve it. But Rose, whenever I think of anything that's really about soothing and comforting and uplifting to the heart, that's really cultivating joy and inner peace, love and compassion, I think of Rose. Also, I think of Rose for time of grief and loss. And I myself have been carrying a little bottle, a one ounce bottle of rose petal elixir. I've just been carrying it in my pocket over the last month. There's just con such continued suffering in all ways on our planet. And I, like many of us have a very tender heart. So the rose is being really, really good medicine for me right now to just help me to really show up with an open heart and to be able to continue to do all the work that I do to serve <clears throat> our beautiful Mother Earth and to serve the pollinators and serve people. So there's a whole rose. Oh, so beautiful. And um, as I said, we gather them every day. And you can either dry them whole if you want to, or you can also lay them out. You can take the petals off. Some people do that. This is in our drying room where we're just drying the rose petals that goes into our peaceful heart tea. So it's really depends on what somebody is moved to, but Rose, I think Rose is the medicine of this time, really helping our hearts to stay open and to stay in a more peaceful place, um, helping us to be less reactive. And I hope, you know, for us to be more responsive, that we can be caring and kind to ourselves, to each other, to our neighbors, even to people that we disagree with. It's not easy. Um, but Rose offers an opportunity for, for deep peace. Mm. And then later in the fall, we get rose hips. Mm -hmm. So these are gathered. Um, sometimes I gather them after the first frost because I like to cut them in half and dry them in a food dehydrator. Um, I love rose hip tea in the wintertime. Also, they're full of seeds, but you can just barely nibble on the outside edges of roses, rose hips. And um, some people make rose hip jam. Yeah, but that's what happens in the fall is then the rose hips come. Yeah, and I wanted to just to speak to Yarrow. Yarrow um, originally is coming to us from various parts of Europe, um, has naturalized all over the Northern part of North America. It's a beautiful, beautiful healing flower. I think every healing garden, every herbalist garden needs to have some nice big clumps of yarrow because it's just so beneficial for yarrow's medicine. So there we are gathering. And the flowers will bloom over two or two and a half weeks. So we're gathering the flowering tops. Um, what I do with them is I dry some for tea and we make some uh, fresh in a tincture. 
You can also dry the leaves. The leaves and the flowers are very, very strongly astringent and vulnerable. So for any kind of stopping of bleeding and healing wounds, you can, you can put yarrow in a healing salve. Um, very, very helpful for both, as I said, for deep wounds, yarrow is very, very helpful for healing. Um, hemorrhoids, inflammatory gut conditions. I just was working with, a. we have a wonderful gardener here this year who has a sweet dog they rescued um, in their ancestral homeland of Mexico. And um, their dog was spayed recently and the little incision just, there's such an active puppy, the incision wasn't healing. And so I had made actually a hydrosol out of yarrow, which is just a copper still. And we use boiling water to help. Um, it's a whole tubing system. So what we're getting is like a really medicated water. And so we started uh, spritzering um, Yali's wound with the yarrow and with a calendula hydrosol. And it healed so beautifully. So that's another way of a topical healing for wounds. And then here's the calendula. I just wanted people to see the beautiful, beautiful calendula. This is how we lay it out to dry. Um, and this is another drying system for folks who may live in smaller places. The it's an it's a very affordable collapsible drying rack system. And I gave you the the website from Fedco Seeds, which is in Maine. Um, I bought mine from them. So, and you can see it stacks. You can either, you don't even have to use all of them, but you can also clip them together. Um, so in, for people living in smaller spaces, this might be a really great way to dry herbs. And also some people like to dry in a dehydrator. You just need to make sure that it's not above 95 degrees if you're using a de dehydrator. And then salve. This is why I wanted to end with, just talking a little bit about calendula and salve. Such a wonderful way to have topical healing um, herbal preparations. And there's the calendula. We grow, I think we planted close to 800 little seedlings in our garden. Very, very antiseptic and antifungal, really helpful for inflammation um, topically. And then internally, it's a really favorite one of mine for ulcers and any kind of inflammation of the gut. Very, very helpful. So the list goes on. So many different types of topicals. As I said, chap, chap lips and sore nipples and inflamed vaginal tissue and diaper rash. Very, very, very valuable. There we are planting the little calendula seedlings into our beds with straw. There we are gathering. We gather calendula every other day. So we are um, laying them out to dry. That's when we're, that's where I'm picking one. And um, I just wanted to mention, so we have a lot of calendula growing in our gardens and the Grow a Row project, I've given you the website, is a project that I seeded um, to encourage people all over to be growing calendula and drying it and making oil and salve and then donating it to projects that are working with um, anybody who'd been sex trafficked or any domestic violence projects. Calendula is such a deeply, deeply healing oil and salve. So this website gives a lot of information, including a 30 minute video on how to make salve. So for people who might wanna have never made salve and you wanna make a salve, certainly go on the website and you can watch the video and hopefully it will inspire you to make salve and, and to give some away, yeah. And there's the calendula. Um, Molly took that from upside under underneath the screen. It's a beautiful, beautiful photograph of the calendula um, starting to dry that was just laid out. Yeah. And so I just wanted to end with this beautiful poem, which I love, also written by a Maine poet who's a friend of mine. And he writes, when the animals come to us asking for our help, will we know what they are saying? And when the plants speak to us in their delicate, beautiful language, will we be able to answer them? And when the planet herself sings to us in our dreams, will we be able to wake ourselves and act? So thank you. And thank you to Gary. And thank you to all of you um, for, for joining in. Yeah. Amazing. I love that. 
poem at the end, yeah. not to mention everything else. Yes. It's a beautiful, beautiful poem of maybe. Yeah. I keep saying I'm going to memorize that poem. I always have it in my slideshows. I just have to memorize it because it's a beautiful poem and a beautiful just a reminder to all of us of this incredible, beautiful planet we are living and breathing and connected with. And I just feel like as humans, it is our, it is our calling to wherever we live to be making a difference in the health and well-being of our Mother Earth and of all the life that's here. So I am. Um, yeah, so here's to hopefully more and more people tending gardens and sanctuaries and sharing their plant wisdom and uh, inspiring children to take good care of um, the legacy of which we are, you know, we are blessed to be part of. And um, there are so many wise teachers who are speaking and teaching on behalf of of earth um, we are very blessed in this time to receive teachings and um, and to be inspired to really be good human beings <laughs> yeah so thank you so much for inviting me and i just um i'm so looking forward to hearing different people speaking and just again all the ways that we're all just scattering seeds and watering seeds and nourishing the mycorrhizal fungi. Um, yeah, every, all the ways we can share is such a great gift. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanna emphasize one of the things that I'm really loving about what you're saying that I think is so key to all of the healing we're attempting to do on this planet is, is dropping back into and remembering these ways of perceiving and communicating and being with the the energetic and the the communic the actual communication of plants of our planet that she is literally talking to us through us all day every day that we are her and that you know when we're so caught in our rational rational brains um we can't we're not recognizing this this other way of being that's actually natural to us and i feel so strongly is is absolutely crucial to coming back into and anyway I just, yeah that's one of my many takeaways from what you're sharing and plants you know plants birds pollinators they are so present in our lives and are such teachers to remind us um of how blessed we are. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Really deep gratitude. You too. Yeah.